what we call our closing retreat. So we've actually been with the fellows all day, and we've been hearing their highlights and some of their experiences from the year. And I had what I thought was one of the most um, amazing reflections on the day, and it comes from our fellow who lives in China. And she made a video about her experience from the day she landed in the plane at Dulles and through all the activities, the snow, the snow days, the many events, the 4th of July she experienced here. And she said, I was far away from my country, but I was not far away from my home. And I thought that was so amazing because after only a year here, she was able to create that home and that community because of all the people around her. And those people were the Atlas Core Fellows, but they were also all of you. Her friends, her colleagues, her supervisors, people she met at the bus stop. And that's true for all our fellows. So we thank you all for being with us tonight. Because tonight we celebrate just one milestone on what is a continuous journey for these fellows. And know that you all play a special role on this journey. And we know that while tonight is a special moment in time, we look forward to seeing what more they achieve in the future. And so tonight is a celebration, and we're going to celebrate a dynamic group of fellows. And so I'd like to have you all join me in welcoming our fellows that we're celebrating this evening. So please put your hands together. <laughs> Woo your special night and we are going to celebrate you and we do have to admit today is a pretty today is a bittersweet moment for us all because it is one that we bid you farewell on this phase in your life journey but we also know that it is only the beginning of amazing things to come so we're all here tonight to celebrate with you as your community as your friends people who become your family and as people who enjoy working with you every day so it's good to know that today is not a eulogy, but more of a celebration. It is not an end, but a milestone on this journey. And alumni who have preceded you in your journey are also sending their best from around the world. It's also so fun this day because when we announce it's Celebration of Service Day, we have all this alumni that write Facebook messages or are sending us emails saying, oh, share these sentiments with this class because we're so excited for them. And one of them was uh, Chitza our fellow from Zimbabwe, who just actually completed her service in May, and she sent these wishes. A journey of learning and unlearning, cultural shock, cross-cultural adaptability, leadership, work, fun, interaction, ice skating, cultural um, picnics, the list is endless. But most importantly, here is to the inevitable expansion of all of your minds. Never will you be the same person after your completion of service. Here's to you all and to your future endeavors. The world awaits your brilliance. Congratulations, Class 16. Yeah. Yeah. I think a beautiful way to start our evening. So as you transition home, the big picture of what Atlas Core means in the world, and hopefully what Atlas Core means in your professional and personal development, will take time to unveil itself. While you may not be serving side by side in the United States with your fellow fellows as time progresses, Know that you are no longer going through life's journey alone. No matter where you end up, you will always be an Atlas Core Fellow, and there will always be other fellows and members of the community willing to support you no matter where you are. Of course, tonight is more about reflection and celebration than future planning. And who better to reflect on their experience than an Atlas Core Fellow? So amongst all the fellows that are up here in front of the room, we ask them, who would you like to speak on your behalf? Who would you like to share your fellow journey? And they selected Unwuli, an Atlas Core Fellow from Nigeria, who served at Thinking Beyond Borders in San Francisco. So I welcome Unwuli Ford to share his journey. Thank you.
Thank you, Abby. Hello, good evening to everyone. Um, and welcome to our graduation. We are very pleased to have each and every one of you. Um, pardon me, I have two cards. And uh, my speech is a bit rough, but uh, I'm very sure I'll be able to collect my things and put them all together. So um, I will begin. According to Thomas More, an, an English humanist and statesman and Chancellor of England in, from 1977 to 1535, he said, education is not the piling of learning information, data, facts, skills, or ability. That, that's, his, that's his training or instruction. But rather, education is not hidden as seed. I want to say good evening to everyone. And I'd like to say a big thank you to my fellow fellows for entrusting me this responsibility to speak on your behalf. And I would also like to say a big thank you to the founder and CEO of Atlas Corp, who isn't here today, who's on vacation, and the formidable team of Atlas Corp, who has made this remarkable journey for the last 12 months a worthwhile experience. I would begin by saying that my time in my fellowship, the beginning was mixed. I had high and low times. Um, first, I come from a country formerly colonized by the British. So imagine me having a conversation with Americans. I would walk into a coffee shop and this person for a biscuit rather than a cookie. And then I would walk, and then I requested to buy a cap and I was told with a hat. <laughs> Uh, one time, my employer chipped in gently that I had misspelled a word wrongly, the word program. And I thought to myself, but I'm an English major. I could, I could never spell <laughs> the word program. But I realized what I did. I added N M E to the spelling like a British person. At the point, even my Apple computer had began to reject my words as well. So I was oriented, <laughs> oriented into the American culture. But I also, but besides the fun stuff, I also struggled at my work to find my feet, and I'm glad that I did. But I say to my fellows that I know you've we've been here all day, and we know that you've heard all the heavy stuff, and we've all discussed. And now for this speech, I would like to say, you know, to settle on on light stuff. I know that our work requires us to take care of other people, even judging from the data and our discussions this morning. We prioritize people above money. But rather than thinking of ourselves or pursuing our own interests without guilt, whenever we stand, I would like to share the lessons I picked up, um, I picked up this year and my attitude for the future. I must also add that I'm very, I must also add that I'm, you know, when I was told I was going to be your class speaker, I was very surprised because I thought to myself, what would I tell such distinguished people, professionals? What would I tell people who have accomplished so much in their countries? And what could I share that would be worth your while as we are about to separate from this? How many years only from those? So I would like to share my experience with you and what I have learned. Apparently, I wrote this letter to myself when I arrived on the 24th of August, and I realized that everything I wrote here, I accomplished. And so, and I think it's a worthwhile lesson, and I think it's an eternal lesson. And I'd like to share with all of us to continue to adopt, because it really helped me, and I was pretty successful at my place of service at TV in San Francisco. In the beginning, I would say that our community as an, alum and as an alumni is the most powerful and most connected network that we have, and the most, yes, the most connected. You know, when I had to make a trip to DC in March, because um, I live in San Francisco, it's pretty isolated. I called Lucy for me, who has left us in May, and she hosted me. She took care of me, and I, I don't know, you know, um, Washington DC really well, and the transportation system just makes things more complicated. <laughs> but I know I, I came to you know, DC. She stayed up to twelve midnight waiting for me, and she received me and took care of me for the three days I was here. I was living here on a, on an Apple's core. Mission. I was here on, a, on my, um, my my organization's work. 
And even when I had to come to DC for the second time, I worried and I said, where am I going to stay? What am I going to do? Like, I felt so lonely. And I called Grace. And she's been remarkable, you know, just taking care of it. I've never felt so loved and so connected to people sitting here, just talking to Hulu and Sarah and Grace and Nida and Angela, you know, and, and you, and Safa and Perm. I could mention everyone's name. It has been a joy and it's a great connection. You know, this benefit also extends professionally. It's not just because we love one another, because you know, you may have figured you may not have figured out what you want to do or what how you want to extend your experiences. But I can tell you that from our connection, whatever it is that we do, like I said, we're a powerful network. We can create we can create opportunities to be headhunted. We we have called we have cross-cultural experiences that make us really powerful. And we can do it, because I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in the world economic form among the YGLs, they are the most powerful, they are the, I mean, within the world of them, they're like the most powerful source. And within our first call, we can be the same, connected together. But for the remaining lesson, I'd like to share with you what I wrote to myself in San Francisco, and I want to share with you to adopt as well, because like I said, it's been very, very helpful to me. And I can say that I was pretty successful by applying these things. So the first thing I would say to you is to be open. As we return back to our fellow, our, our fellow countries, I would say that you should, you should be open. Be open to learning, be open to people, be open to knowledge. Keep your expectations open and absorb and grow. Because the truth is, you must grow. Do not be afraid. You will be fine, but be courageous. Give more of yourself for the purpose of which you pursue. Tell yourself that now that you're back home, you're on a mission. Be the best that you can be. Ask questions, make mistakes, and explore. Explore. Seek new things, seek new people, and seek new places. Reach out. You may be a private person, but step out of your comfort zone. Sometimes you will, make, you will have to take on more responsibility than you can handle, but give it your all. Sometimes friends, people need that little extra. That illusion sometimes that, that you are stronger, that you, that you would understand better. So take all the responsibility and reach out. Be curious, ask a lot of questions. And say no. If you are stretched, if it breaches a code of conduct, or if it would hurt someone, say no. And last but not least, be confident. You are an intelligent and as, you are intelligent and assertive people. And you could you and you don't have to feel you have to feel less. Rather, be more. Be yourself. Have a great journey. At the end, be content because you've made it a worthwhile journey. My fellow fellows, it's been an honor to be your colleague this one year. I, I couldn't be the proudest. And it would be an honor to stay in touch with all of you. And I wish every one of you a wonderful journey as we go on to our various lives. We may not know what is next, but I know that we stay connected together. Something will figure itself out because we are powerful just being together. So I wish you all the best as we go into the next steps, whatever they may be. And I hope that the things I have shared with you would one way or the other be helpful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anne Louis. I think uh, great food for thought for all of us. And I think it's so nice to have someone share from their dedicating a year of service what this has meant to them. And our next speaker is someone very special who's actually dedicated an entire life to service and has had such influence on the service movement, both domestically and internationally. And I would be remiss not to read a few highlights from his illustrious career. Um, some of those that especially pertain to our, um, our work here at Atlas Corps. In the 1960s, Harris Wofford helped Sergeant Shriver plan and launch the Peace Corps. Later, Harris left the White House to serve as a Peace Corps representative in Africa and director of its largest program in Ethiopia. In the early 90s, Harris Wofford also served as a U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania. 
President Clinton asked him to become the Chief Executive Officer of the Corporation for National and Community Service. During the rest of the 1990s, AmeriCorps grew from 20,000 to 50,000, and then with the support of President George Bush, it grew to 75,000. In recent years, Harris has served as Chair of America's Promise Alliance, joined the campaign for President Obama, and served as Senior Advisor to the Franklin Project of the Aston Institute. In 2013, Harris Wofford received a Presidential Citizens Medal from President Obama. Atlas Corps is also honored to have Harris Wofford as part of our Senior Advisory Board, a title he has held since the founding of the organization and continues to play a key role in today. So just as you look upon yourselves and what this one year of service has meant to you, we're honored to welcome Harris Wofford here to share her lifetime of service and the impact you can have on so many people. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Harris Wofford. I can't tell you how happy I am to be with you. Uh, being somewhat hard of hearing, to put it mildly, uh, I want you to put up uh, your hand if I'm not using this machine in right. Uh, can you hear me? Is it working? Right. Well, I wish this were working better. Uh, I feel uh, strange being here without Scott Beal here. Uh, I, <laughs> He's live streaming. He's joining us via web. Well, thank you for the information. So I, I said to myself, it's about time I really say to Scott, Scott, I'm proud of you. And it's very unusual for me to claim pride, um, but you'll see why I uh, would like to have in your list of uh, activities. Uh, I would like to. Uh, claim that I'm one of you in spirit, if, um, uh, as my grandsons would say, it's somewhat dubious of whether you want me to go around the world with you or to <laughs> I had a bad fall about six months ago, so I have a great, great point of uh, wisdom for you. Uh, don't fall. <laughs> and, for Aspen, and for Atlas, don't fail either and do this. Uh, but I've seen uh, the, pers uh, the persistence of Scott and the creativity, and uh, I associate myself with his kind of creativity. Um, and that is to say, I'm proud of you, or proud to be here, able to not only see you, but if I don't talk too long, uh, hear from you. Uh, now let me just explain my uh, proximity to you. When I was uh, 10 years old, um, I, uh, the reasons we haven't figured out in a non-political family, I declare, and, and a Republican family in a Republican town, um, I declared myself for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and it was my first campaign. The first political one is another story, it really was in England, but I was 21 in terms of a candidate to be campaigning for. But when I was 12, my adventurous grandmother, who didn't have enough money to keep her apartment uh, after her, my grandfather died, but found the Tramp Trips organization had extraordinary cheap uh, uh, reservations available. And um, she found that if she went uh, with the tramp trip, she could save enough money to be able to uh, keep the apartment if she went for long enough trips. So she said to me one day, would you like to accompany me around the world for six months? Um, and it'll mean you'll step back from the seventh grade, you'll have to do part of it over again. Would you like to come? And I jumped at it and said, thank goodness I said yes. And uh, it, it, uh, I never recovered from the world being the essential question that interested me over uh, all these years. Uh, now, when, when, when I, so when I was 12, that happened. But the first thing that my wife and I did after we each graduated from 
the University of Chicago and University of Minnesota uh, in her part uh, to go to get a fellowship uh, to go to India. Um, at that point, Mahatma Gandhi was still alive. And at college, I had read his autobiography and, and, and got very ignited uh, by Mohandas Gandhi uh, and started looking for it. And in the fellowship, we got. But in those months, uh, Gandhi was shot and killed. And the tragedy of partition, uh, Gandhi said, you can cut me, but don't cut India in two. Uh, and in cutting India to, into two nations, Pakistan and India, um, in, in, in doing that, uh, before, during, and after, there were terrible riots. Uh, and Mahatma Gandhi was saying, my life is a failure. And he said it repeatedly to his close friends and in writing. And uh, I, however, uh, with the support of my wife, uh, more than ever wanted to get going on this fellowship in 1949 when we were 21 years old. Um, and uh, I, it was from India I didn't uh, get engaged by a civic organization uh, the way you are, uh, or a, a venture that other people were running and you were helping. Um, we were on our own, uh, visiting Gandhi's ashram that was still going without him, and had some time with Nehru, and I, I can't tell you what we did in that year um, but looking, the first thing we saw when we got to uh, Bombay, and it was the uh, sort of worst mistake of many marriage in our 50 years of marriage before my wife died. Uh, the, probably my worst mistake was piloting our first day in India. I don't know what your first day here was like, but uh, ours was not what I uh, sought. Uh, I resisted getting a good reservation and a good hotel because we had a clue as to where uh, there's a guy, Mr. Munshi, who rented his rooms and taught Hindi. And I said that we, you know, we were supposed to arrive about dawn on the airport and it'll be a while before we get in and we don't need a hotel reservation. Uh, and it wouldn't be very Gandhi like to. to the first thing you do is go into a fancy hotel. Um, oh, how wrong I was. It might have been very good for our marriage if I, if, if I had uh, not been the one who saw it produced at 3 a.m. Uh, an early arrival of the airplane instead of my know-it-all from my... Uh, from my uh, 12-year-old trip with my grandmother, I acted as if I knew everything about India. I said that tra tra traffic will be bad getting in. And anyway, at about 4 a.m., we were dumped on the street uh, by the Taj Mahal, not the great beautiful place, but the monument to the British um, in Bombay. Um, there was no room at the end. Uh, we arrived at around 4 a.m., and that's another story, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it was not a very good beginning. Uh, then, uh, in my, as, we, as we were heading home, uh, I realized that what had been the first sort of political site that we saw uh, was on the, the Taj Mahal Hotel's desk, uh, where there was no room. There was a sign saying, "South no South African white is uh, is is uh, permitted to have a room in this hotel." And the desk man who didn't have a room for us uh, said, "Well, you see, that's there because we hear that in your country, no, that, that in South Africa, 
uh, the whites of South Africa are doing it to their fellow South Africans uh, who are of color and in, in their, in most cases, far longer than they. They were uh, doing to them what you in America are doing to the Negroes, as he put it. And uh, how many times in that trip the sense that the greatest uh, moral weight that the United States was carrying was our segregation in the other quarter of the United States in the Deep South. Uh, and and uh, when we were leaving, I said, you realize that the one world that had been our, our our campaign as students for World Federation and winning the war by uniting, uh, et cetera. Uh, it was, what are we going to, I was countless times asked by the Gandhi followers, what have you done about that? And the more uh, committed ones that would be, have you ever gone to jail against those segregation laws? And I hadn't done anything. And uh, I, we headed forth coming home, um, in, in my case, to want to be part of the civil rights movement. And I, a little, very close to this building, uh, Howard Law School, uh, in the building with the tower on top of the hill, next to the very good public tele uh, swimming hole, that, that there it is now, that I tried the other day. Um, I went to Howard University Law School and was the first white uh, to be graduated from Howard University Law School. There were a lot of different people in the university college or in the medical school and others, but that was the case in the law school. And it was a, a, a law school that was focused on the litigation on civil rights. And before each Supreme Court argument, uh, the, the the, the great uh, African-American lawyers were uh, arguing the case with our faculty of the law school and the students listened and the faculty acted like judges asking questions and uh, it was a great experience. Uh, it led to uh, a lot of other things that uh, it would mean I won't hear from you if I started telling them. But, but um, what, what I, uh, what I want, want to uh, put to you, uh, uh, the fellows, as a, as a question to comment on it to the extent that you want to, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Gandhi and Socrates, they both uh, liked the proposition that, that, uh, the, the question uh, is the great thing, and what we do about it and how we answer it, whatever the question is, that begs the question. The, the, the key thing is what the question is, but follow the question where it leads is Socrates' rule for a good conversation and for a good society. And I would be, um, you know, very interested in the, any of the fellows who wanted to tell me what the, what your question is now that, that uh, you've had these various experiences uh, here uh, in this little part of the world or or in this country, which is a little part of the world. And one of the main lessons that uh, the, the earlier trips uh, with the the later ones, uh, 10 different times in my life, is realizing that uh, if you take the, in the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States in, in battling, fortunately not against each other in the explosion of, the, of bombs, but getting very close to it. Um, if, if, if you live through that, Cold War period, you'd think that the only two nations in the world, the only thing that counted were these two countries, the Soviet Union, which still was existing, and, 
and the United States, uh, and that the great majority of the people of the world were not with either or not caring very much politically about it. And we acted as if everything in our foreign policy is related to the Soviet Union and how to check them or stop them or overturn them. Um, and India was, uh, Gandhi liked to say, we're one fifth of the world. And if you add China to that, you're seeing um, a little more of what the, the, the numbers are. But your experience goes beyond numbers, and I'd love, love to hear them. And I may need your translation help. Um, there is this old joke that uh, people with hard of hearing uh, probably have been telling for uh, centuries. But there's this long time uh, aging couple sitting on their, feet, uh, their porch. Uh, rocking in the rocking chair, and one of them, the, let's say the, the, the woman, says to her husband, Henry, I'm, I'm proud of you. And he uh, kept nodding his head and finally said, say it again, what? And she said, I'm proud of you. And he said, well, I'm tired of you too. <laughs> so, so it stopped the cure. He's heard me so many times. I don't have to worry that, that, that you were uh, as tired of me, but he did. But I would love to hear from you. Uh, anyone who wants to, you know, I had this great experience of two years as the African man for the Peace Corps living in Addis Ababa. Director of our program, which uh, was uh, to uh, was 400 strong, Emperor Haile Selassie had asked for 500 Peace Corps teachers, and uh, and by the way, <laughs> uh, you got to stop me. Uh, you you started me <laughs> on this. I have the experience of working with Sergeant Shriver in the Peace Corps, and the first experience was aside from brainstorming how to organize a Peace Corps uh, was to go around the world with Sergeant Schreiber. And the first stop was Kenya. Is anyone here from Kenya? Uh, the second stop, Nigeria, on blue. And, and, uh, and then on to East Africa, and then India, and then Burma, and various other things. But in Kenya, uh, in Kenya, uh, Kwame Nkrumah was president and our prime minister, and he loved the idea of the Peace Corps. But then he said, Mr. Schreiber, what would you think if we were able to, willing to send young graduates of our university up on Legon Hill? What would you think about that? And Schreiber, who had been head of the school board in Chicago, and passionately involved in education, enthusiastically said, yes, that's a wonderful idea, we'll do it. And I can speak for Chicago school system, who I can assure you that they will be welcome there and elsewhere. And it got started by Schreiber uh, a few years later as the Volunteers in Service to America. I don't you know, you've probably heard that, of that history. Uh, Neil Boyer of our Ethiopia program uh, ran it. Uh, then both houses of Congress shifted to one party, very much like the Tea Party, and one or a number of the of the uh, non-one worlders uh, got wind of the fact that the Peace Corps was helping to fund foreigners coming to the United States. And it was so miserably embarrassing to hear the, to read the uh, debate that led to them ruling out the Peace Corps, organizing a return, a, 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 a Volunteers to America program. And uh, it went first from the Peace Corps to the State Department and the Congress caught up with us and it got ended. And then comes along a Scott Peel and he has an idea 
and it's it's he got very tired of my asking why it's not a thousand or ten thousand yet. It's exactly what Sergeant Shriver would say. But these these steady start growth uh, may well be just what we want. Uh, John Kennedy, when I set off set off for Africa, um, John and President Kennedy uh, had sworn in the 400, 300 Peace Corps volunteers to go to India. And uh, on the way in, he said, you know, this Peace Corps will be really serious when it's 100,000 a year. And then in one decade, there'll be a million Americans with first-hand experience in Asia, Africa, as he liked to put it, and you have Latin America. And then for the first time, we may have a large constituency for a good foreign policy. So I'm a quantum leaper, uh, and I'll uh, keep asking Scott, what, what are we going to have a thousand? But uh, you would know whether that's a good idea or not. But my, I mean, my question that I put on the floor, okay, uh, if you're following a question where it leads out of this experience uh, that you're willing to talk about, uh, the, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to hear what some of the questions are that you will follow. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, neglecting this side of the room. It made me realize that when the Peace Corps went forth, uh, we got to 500 in Ethiopia and several thousand in Africa in the first decade, or even less than that. It was two thirds men, uh, one third women. And Schreier was very uh, determined to have equal numbers and more women. Uh, and he got very aware that, that, that the impact in terms of good education from uh, college graduate young Americans coming to faraway places uh, was a stirring thing, part of the education aside from what they were teaching. So the question is the thing. I think we have a question here. Thank you very much uh, for inviting the question. The question I have, uh, which I pose to an uh, amazing host organization, uh, uh, that uh, since we all are the mid-level social innovators and, uh, uh, and emerging global leaders, what impact you want us to create during our period of service in the United States? And what impact do you want us to create beyond our period of service in the United States when we are heading back with more polished skills and more connected community. You, you know, the three purposes of the Peace Corps are, you know, are sort of Schreiber's answer. Uh, first, supplying mid-level uh, work uh, to help meet actual needs of other people. Second is uh, helping other people around the world better understand the United States. And third, and I often think the most important, help Americans uh, come to understand the world better. Uh, and when you say, what do we hope from you? Uh, I, I would like to hope that all of us are part of an open conspiracy to add to what we consider the higher education of uh, our children or our, our citizens, uh, that to, to, to add a period of full-time engagement, whether you call it ser service or otherwise, in another culture, uh, in another country. Um, and I think in, if, if I, I ardently think that's needed by America, but in some form, I think it, my, my question is, how do we help the world do that? And, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not in the most optimistic uh, uh, spirit about that, except for the idea of being right. And uh, 
and it's going to take, uh, uh, we need to be more inventive if we're going to do our duty. And I hope in different ways you'll all be on occasion, like Scott Bale here, you're already pioneers just being here, but uh, becoming creative ones. Uh, and, and having a period of your life when you do it intensely, but otherwise uh, having it something that you're living with all the time. That sounds like the universal question for all is where do they take their service from here? Who decides if they're told it's more? It's also similar to the past. Could you hear her? I couldn't. Oh. <laughs> I said it sounds like a universal question for all of our fellows, just like the third goal of the Peace Corps. I think it is also a question for Atlas Corps fellows of where they take their service. So I think maybe that's a good question for them to ponder. Uh, one that we thank you for thinking, helping us think of. That's a good one. That's a very good point. It, it, there may be a lot of variations that we, we need to recognize and incorporate. Well, excellent. Well, Senator Wofford, we'd like to thank you for thank your you. time. celebrating your year of service. Imagine what a lifetime dedicated to service in your And I think it's all about, we heard of these wonderful stories, and it's a lot about the personal connection and those human relationships and how they snowball into one another. And it's similar to the Atlas Core model of the organization, is that it's not just about the fellows here, it's not just about the host organization, it's about all the pieces that come together to create the overall organization. And that is why we're going to celebrate the next part of our program, and that is our Atlas Core Honors. So we like to recognize special individuals and organizations who played a valuable role in our organization. So I'd like to invite our Chief Operating Officer, Kelly Reed, to help me. Uh, the first award we're going to present this evening is our Distinguished Partner in Global Service. So for Atlas Core, our host organizations go beyond placement sites for our fellows. They are dynamic partners in our mission to utilize global service as a means to develop leaders, strengthen organizations that promote. They host our fellows and serve as a valuable resource to our entire network. Our honoree for tonight is Meridian International Center because they cover all these areas and more. They have hosted four fellows and have partnered with Atlas Core on numerous events and international visitor leadership program panels. And they've served as a resource to share ideas, resources, and to cross-promote each other's initiatives. It is very inspiring for Atlas Core as a young organization of only almost 10 years to collaborate with an organization that has more than 50 years to share that shares our same passion in international exchange and service. So I'd like to thank all our friends at Meridian International Center. And tonight we celebrate them and look forward to continued growth in our partnership. So please join me in recognizing our distinguished partner in global service, Meridian International. I'll just say a couple of words because I'm humbled to share a rostrum with Senator Wofford. Thank you so much, sir, for your career of service to this nation as well as to the one world. Uh, we are here and we're thankful for this wonderful award. We're thankful at Meridian International Center every day for the Atlas Core Fellows who have deigned to spend some time with us. Tonight we're celebrating one of Safa Hajjad. Thank you. <laughs> Safa is one of four Atlas Core Fellows we've been privileged to host at Meridian International Center. Meridian, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, is a global leadership nonprofit organization that focuses on bridging the gaps between and among global leaders. And we do it through collaboration, convening, culture, and training. And we do this by welcoming people from around the world, thousands of people every year, and we do a wide range of visits. We believe that global leaders operate better 
and make better decisions when they have a global organizations like Atlas Core are key partners for us in making sure that we've got that formula down pat. So I thank Kelly, I thank Abby, Scott, wherever you are. Thank you very much for honoring Meridian with this partnership award. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Our next honor is our distinguished supporter in global service. So Atlas Core is based on the idea of collaboration, partnerships between individuals and organizations. Therefore, when we select our distinguished supporter in global service honoree, we look for an organization and or individual that provide multiple investments in Atlas Core. A great example of this multidimensional partnership is today's honoree, America Solidarity. America Solidarity is a nonprofit organization that builds networks among countries in the Americas. When they decided to increase their activities in the United States, they made the connection with Atlas Core. After many ideas, conversations, and plans of action, we achieved welcoming our first Atlas Core America Solidaria Fellows to the United States as part of Atlas Core Class 16. Now we look forward to growing that relationship into the future. So on that note, I am going to ask our America Solidaria Fellows, Angela from Colombia, Lucia from Nicaragua, and Nicolas from Chile, to come forward to help us present this award, and for all of you to join me in recognizing our distinguished supporter in global service, America Solidaria. So much. It's an honor to be here with all of you and especially with uh, our fellows. And really, America Solidaria has been around for 13 years in Chile, which is its home base. It's one of the very few uh, uh, NGOs of this nature, volunteer nature, that's based in the Southern Hemisphere. And our philosophy could not be more aligned with Atlas Corps. And it's really America's serving the Americas and the very best. Indicators of that are our fellows are, who are here to my right. So thank you so much for the partnership. It really uh, has been key to our first year and a half, almost two years uh, here in the United States and getting set up and settled and uh, we couldn't have hoped for anything more. So thank you so much. Before we get to the uh, big finale of uh, the highlighting all of our fellows, is our distinguished volunteer in global service. So this, the, excuse me, the distinguished volunteer in global service award is given to an Atlas Corps volunteer or volunteers who have gone above and beyond in their contributions and innovations to Atlas Corps. Today, the person we honor is Chelsea Milkoff. Chelsea is what we call a trifecta contributor at Atlas Corps. She serves on our selection board, who helps review applications. She has served as an Atlas local ambassador to two Atlas Corps fellows, Michael from South Sudan and Dan from Kenya. And she's also a Return Peace Corps volunteer for, who served in Uganda, who now, on the Return Peace Corps volunteers in Washington, D.C., is their community service director and is helping us implement our new partnership as Partnerships for Peace with the Return Peace Corps community. And now, Chelsea fully understands the value of service, especially global service, as she reflected when we told her she got the award. As an RPCV, I look for ways to stay actively engaged with developing world leaders. Atlas Corps and service alive and well in Washington, D.C. Please join me in welcoming to congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Abby, and thank you, everyone. Um, Yes, like I said, I, I think I said it the best. I forgot that I read that email. Um, but yes, Atlas Corps has truly been a, a continuation of my Peace Corps service here in D.C. And I joined the U.S. Peace Corps to meet the world, move to Washington, D.C. 
CDC, the world came and met me um, through these through these uh, fellows, and it's just been phenomenal. And um, I, I, there's no other greater feeling than interviewing somebody in Pakistan through Skype on the selection board, and then meeting them in DC a couple months later because they were selected as a fellow, and uh, hanging out with. Uh, my fellow Dan and, and uh, you know just catching up about Africa and things like that. It's just super fun. So um, thank you everyone. I really appreciate the recognition, but it's really you guys who are going out there and, and, and carrying on this mission. And, and thank you guys so much. Excellent. Well, congratulations to all our honorees. And now the big highlight of the evening. Let's hear more about our Atlas Core Fellows that we're recognizing this evening. So I'm going to invite our program director, Meredith Newmark, up front to join me. And we're going to present each of the fellows and share some highlights from their host organization. So Meredith, take it away. All right. Thank you, Abby. It has been such an honor to work with this group of fellows for a year now. Um, I'm so sad to see some of them going. But um, uh, so just uh, so starting off uh, with going in alphabetical order, um, his first up is Angela, who served at the Latin American Youth Center. Oh. And her supervisor, Elizabeth Moeller, said, Angela had a very positive impact on the LAYC community. She is energetic, caring, with coworkers and clients alike. She's a professional, responsible, and a, a true team player. Congratulations, Angela. Great, congratulations. And then next up, we have Anwuli, who you already had the pleasure of meeting, who served at Thinking Beyond Borders. And her supervisor, Robin, said, by taking on the task of learning digital marketing, and really built a crucial base of content that projects our work and our admission in a fantastic way. Her right about our beauty. Congratulations. Awesome. Next up, we have Grace, who served at uh, Population Action International. And her supervisor, Susanna Dennis, said, Grace has been an amazing asset to AI. She helped to design and led the implementation of a new m and &E framework for our research and advocacy team. Grace's positive attitude, professionalism, and skills of gentle persuasion have made working with her a delight. We are truly fortunate to have her on board. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Hulu, who served at Youth for Understanding in this very building, actually. And her supervisor, David, said, Hulu has enabled almost 100 young visitors from multiple countries to come see a snippet of life in the USA. She master masterfully navigated a quagmire of complexity <laughs> and never faltered in her willingness to provide advice, encouragement, and a warm smile to staff and students who are privileged to enjoy her collegiality. Congratulations, Hulu. <laughs> And next up, we have Isaiah, who served at GBC Health, and he is actually already back in Nigeria, continuing to serve GBC Health's mission. Um, so unfortunately, he couldn't be here tonight, but he's doing amazing work back home. And his supervisor, Sansia, said, Isaiah took the lead in developing our social media platforms, reaching millions of new users in a short period of time via our first ever Twitter chat to commemorate World Malaria Day. We hope we can carry forward the solid foundation that he has left behind in our work. Congratulations. <laughs> Next up, we have John Webbe, accountability project. And his supervisor, Ryan, said John quickly became part of the staff and a friend. His expertise and perspective were invaluable for our organization and our partners. We hope John gained as much as he contributed. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Laura, who served at the UN Foundation. 
and her supervisor, Claire, said, Lara has played an instrumental role in the foundation's recently launched news aggregator for the sustainable development goals. Her breadth in languages, eye for good content, and her positive attitude have made Lara a real pleasure to work with. We can't wait to see where her career will take her next. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Lucia, who served at the Latin American Youth Center. <laughs> we well represent here tonight, uh, cheering on their graduates. Lucia has a radiant smile that welcomes every young woman, young person, sorry, young person who came to the Teen Center, and boundless energy to keep youth engaged. She naturally connects people to one another, has empathy for everyone, and makes each person feel like the most important, amazing person she has met. Next, we have Meta and Kafir, who served at the Nike Foundation of um, Portland. And her supervisor, Sarah, said Meta has been an exceptional contributor to the team. She managed grants and grantee relationships has grown enormously in her storytelling and presentation skills, and charmed all with her kindness, intelligence, and openness. She will be greatly missed. Congratulations. <laughs> and next we have Adam, who serves at the Tahrir Institute of Middle East Policy. And his supervisor, Nancy, says, Mohammed Adam is not only very knowledgeable about his area of focus on media and politics, but also has a very sharp and curious mind. His input and comments add depth to our work, given his knowledge of local socio-political dynamics. His intelligence, collegiality, and grace is deeply felt and appreciated by all our team. Congratulations. <laughs> Best motivator, 
And the winner is Lucia. <laughs> So this is very exciting. Only her and I know the winner right now. We are the same panel of public relations professionals that are our judges. Esther? Thank you, Abby, and good evening to everyone. It is my profound pleasure this evening to announce the winner of our very exciting Bloggy Award competition. And <laughs> I could extend that sentence, but I'm going to, you know, take you out of the suspense. The winner for class 16 in the year 2015. <laughs> <laughs> Our bloody awards is from Laro Palisano. So with that, we'd also like to announce, just as we are sad to see one group go, we know that 
Once a Fellow, Always a Fellow. We also are excited to welcome our next group of fellows, which means the Alice Corps Network is growing bigger and that you will have more people to enjoy. And so know that on September 23rd, in this very same space, we will be welcoming Atlas Corps Class 19. And a little teaser, it is going to be the largest Atlas Corps Class of Fellows ever. We may not be on our point at 1,000 fellows a year, Senator Wofford asked for, but we're sure progressing fast. We encourage you all to mark that date. The information is in your program. And we also invite you all to stick around, join us. We have some refreshments and cake in the back so you can engage with our fellows. And I'm going to ask the fellows to remain up here quickly. We're going to take a quick class photo. And then everyone's free to mingle about. So thank you all for joining us this evening. And we look forward to seeing you next week.